Welcome back. You're watching Stock Picks and joining me to unpack RFG Holdings, Lipstar and Sea Harvest is Anthony Clark from Small Talk Daily Research. Anthony, always a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, good afternoon. Nice to be here. Hello from sunny Cape Town. Wonderful. Uh, Anthony, let's talk about uh, these accounters maybe as a group. Uh, they're all looking towards food. Is that why you chose them? Yeah, we were asked to do a theme this week, as mm. we do in our in our discussions. And given I've just come through reporting season, uh, and I want to go, whew, it's been a long reporting season. Um, I've spoken to Lipstar, Rhodes, Sea Harvest, amongst others, in the last two weeks. And uh, Lipstar and Sea Harvest have had results, and then Rhodes had a five-month trading update, which came out on March 11th. So the market has got a fairly good feeling as to what's going on uh, regarding the consumer on the ground. And I have to say it's fairly mixed. Uh, we all know, uh, given our discussions in past programming regarding the constrained nature of the consumer, particularly in the different uh, categories that uh, groceries are sold in, mm -hmm. we know the lower end of the market consumers are really f uh, finding it very tight with uh, ongoing rampant inflation, particularly mealy meal and in certain other categories. The middle market is being squeezed by higher interest rates, lack of uh, yeah, wage and employment growth. And the upper markets who do have this disposable income and are still spending of the likes of the Woolies and some of the high end eateries are reining in their spending because, as we discussed on air, everybody is a little bit uncertain regarding what's going to be happening at the election at the end of May. So they're all keeping their pennies, or should I say their cents, in their pockets to see um, how it all pans out. So, looking at all three companies, the commonality between all three is sadly I can't report any of them have actually produced uh, uh, share price gains year to date. Lipstar is down 1%, Rhodes is down 1%, and Sea Harvest is down 9%. Uh, the other common factor is they're all being uh, beset by the ongoing woes of ESCOM and load shedding, uh, the supply chain issues, particularly of the ports in Durban. But demand for certain products, particularly internationally, remains very strong. And having spent time at all three companies on site visits, and speaking to the CEOs, uh, what I can tell you is that South African produce and South African produced food goods are in high demand internationally because we are seen to be a quality, top quality producer uh, in demand, which hopefully bodes well uh, if Transnet and Portnet ever decide to uh, get their act together. So some, uh, some silver linings to what are grey clouds in the underlying consumer space. And uh, we can start with any stock that uh, takes your choosing. Yes, let's start with Lipstar. We saw revenue there up 5.2%. I think margins also uh, improving uh, quite a bit. Anthony, let's talk about what you saw on the ground and also uh, your overall sentiments with this counter. Yeah, Lipstar is a stock uh, trading currently at 3 Rand 49. It's on a PE of uh, roughly, we pick, pick a number, it's about 7.3 and the dividend yield of 4.3%. You're correct, they had results out uh, literally last week. Uh, headline earnings per share were up 6% to 47.7 cents a share. But what uh, was clearly evident in the Lipstar results is if this was a tale of two halves. They had a completely awful half one, where earnings slumped to 10.5 cents a share. And then, uh, like a phoenix from the ashes, they rose in the second half, which seems counterintuitive. But what they saw is in their key accounts, which is basically Checkers and Woolworths, whilst consumers are still shopping at those higher end uh, 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 retailers, they might not be buying the fancy high end goods, but they still want to buy what we would call quality groceries, but perhaps at slightly cheaper price points. So the days of buying, you know, fancy imported cheeses and hams may be over, but they're still going to buy imported pasta and tomatoes and chicken snitchels and the occasional treat. And Woolworths and uh, Checkers certainly saw that uh, through their tills, and that benefited Lipstar, who are the largest suppliers to those companies. What Lipstar also very, very successfully did is, at long last, some uh, businesses which had been underperforming, particularly in personal care and, uh, and household goods. You know, for example, they make uh, personal care products and they make washing powder and, and cleaning products that had been loss making. That's now turned the corner and back into profit, and that swing alongside a slightly better second half led to the earnings that we saw. The market did not expect these earnings to be uh, slightly better, and the share price has picked up quite nicely in the last uh, few weeks from a low of around 3 Rand to about 3 Rand 49 as I speak. 
But as I've commented to you in the past on the show, uh, Lipstar to me is one of those uh, companies that could potentially be taken out because the sum of the part is worth significantly more than the whole. And interestingly, the uh, major shareholder, which is now a US uh, private equity firm, which owns just under 40% of the company, will be the kingmaker should this company ever decide uh, to be a target for somebody in the next 12 to 18 months. And I think uh, to quote a parable that I was given uh, by the company last week, Anthony, something has to give in the next 12 months. Sure. We don't know which way it's going, but regarding that ownership stake about 40%, something has to give. Very interesting times ahead, I think, for Lipstar Anthony. Also keen uh, to get your thoughts there on the insurance proceeds that the company would have uh, received uh, after the, that Oshongweni fire. And what that has done for the set of numbers here, uh, is it a distortion or is it still a good story from a company that was, of course, uh, you know, in, loss, in a loss-making position and right back into the black? Yeah, uh, the headline earnings per share basically strips out the benefit from the insurance claim. Uh, you know, as I, as I tease, uh, you know, the benefit of being an independent analyst is you can say what you like, knowing that no one's going to write to you and complain because you complain to me. And uh, sadly, when the workers allegedly burned down that farm and uh, put themselves out of jobs, mm. it was highly unlikely that Lipstar would put a new mushroom factory down in Natal because the, the mushroom market is very difficult. Uh, and uh, removing one factory from the system actually led to an uplift in the pricing of mushrooms. So sadly, uh, they took the insurance proceeds, they banked it, and uh, the mushroom farm will, will not be rebuilt. So uh, burning down the factory may have benefited Lipstar, but it certainly didn't benefit the workers or the regional economy that it operated in. And I see no, I see no plans for mushrooms to be expanded. I think in due course, they will exit Denny's and just keep the value-added sources condiments and uh, and soups range the physical farming will uh, will will go to mushrooms I do hope they keep their yogurts, <laughs> um, Anthony. Uh, let's move on now and take a look at Sea Harvest. Uh, they've also done a super well. I think uh, they're a big part of that uh, demand in Europe uh, story that you're speaking about, about our foods being in demand uh, in other parts of the world. Absolutely. Um, unlike most food groups, uh, wild caught fish is a product which is in finite supply, but in, but in increasingly strong demand. Uh, we know in many markets around the world that consumers want to eat healthier. Uh, there's a trend uh, moving away towards from meat to other forms of proteins. And we all know that everybody likes a nice piece of fish. The trouble is fish takes time to grow. Uh, climatic conditions mean that perhaps the catches are not what they used to be back in the day due to overfishing or at one point El Nino or La Nina. But demand continues to be strong. So those that actually have good supplies of uh, of wild caught fish can basically name their own price in international markets. And the likes of a sea harvest and an Oceana uh, certainly did that in the period where there was very strong international demand for products, which led to significant increase in their pricing power, with a weakness in the rand again translated into a much better um, uh, increase of the bottom line for a fishing division. However, fishing is a, a difficult uh, job. Uh, again, you just can't take your trawler out and hope to catch. Uh, you have to be in the right area where the fish are and the weather and the temperature of the sea has a significant impact on that mm. so you, you will have spent the money on the crew on diesel and having your boat out at sea for many weeks maybe coming back with a suboptimal catch wow. and that was the trend amongst fishing companies last year sea harvest also has a foods division uh, primarily based in butter and cheese around ladysmith there wasn't enough milk in the system which meant that uh, there wasn't enough product to be made so again they were caught uh, in two areas where there was significant demand for their product. But in the wild caught fish side, they couldn't catch enough of it because the fish had disappeared. And on the dairy side, the cows were not milking enough because there wasn't enough milk. And that basically came back to, uh, to bite sea harvest, where earnings were down 5% in a period to one rand a share. Not all is lost, um, even though the share price has been extremely weak. Uh, for the last few years. Uh, it listed in 2017 from memory at about 12.15. It's basically gone downhill ever since. Um, they did a very large transaction called uh, TerraSan mm. uh, about a month and a half ago, which will spearhead their growth in pelagic fishing, which means they'll have hake and all other types of fish to sell to the local and international markets. And then on the abalone business, which is exported to China, it'll basically catapult 
Sea Harvest, we have number one exporter of uh, legally produced abalone in the country. Illegally called abalone is a huge business, as we all know. Mm. And uh, they expect the TerraSan deal to hopefully start um, improving their earnings from 2025. So whilst the share price is down in the dumps at 8 Rand 60, uh, I'm hoping that the TerraSan deal will at long last uh, allow the market to uh, take a better look at Sea Harvest and its international and local prospects. Also interesting about Sea Harvest, uh, Anthony, keen to get your thought of this, is I just uh, lower demand for prawns. I'm so surprised. I might, I must not be doing enough. Uh, but uh, I'm keen to get your thoughts here on the demand for this. There's an oversupply of prawns. Is this something that's seen as a premium product, something that, uh, you know, consumers might uh, do away with in a difficult macroeconomic environment? Yeah, the prawn market is only in Australia. Mm. Uh, sea Harvest, uh, many years ago, bought a concession uh, in Australia, which gives it exclusive rights in perpetuity to catch uh, certain types of shellfish, of which one being prawns. Many of the prawns are, uh, are eaten in Australia. You know, everybody has heard of, of, the, of, of the Australian term, thrown of, a, of shrimp on the barbie mate. <laughs> and also, um, there's a very big market in China. And a combination of the COVID hangover and the fact that the Chinese market uh, reopened late, as we all know, because of their extended COVID restrictions, meant that uh, prawns, uh, which could easily be frozen and stockpiled, were basically in, uh, in excess uh, supply in the marketplace. And whilst fresh prawns did quite well, there was just an oversupply in the marketplace. The Chinese were not uh, basically eating enough and the Australian market was saturated. And we all know when there's too much supply and uh, demand is not matching, prices fall. And that's exactly what happened. You know, it's a seasonal product. And Sea Harvest believes that in, in a couple of years, a prawn market should get back to a, a healthy position. But in the last 12 months, uh, there weren't many, there were too many prawns in the barbie at uh, a too low a price. Let's move on now and touch on uh, Rhodes uh, Food Group. That's an interesting one because it's way more diversified, I think, uh, than uh, the other two that we've spoken about. Uh, let's talk about your thoughts on this one, Anthony. Yeah, I was with Rhodes Foods Management last week on a site visit to see how uh, tinned fruit was made. Mm. Uh, it's always interesting to see how the food that we consume as, uh, as, uh, as consumers is, is basically made with uh, hundreds of ladies cutting and peeling fruits to put into cans. Uh, and the company, as you say, is diverse. Uh, it's got a large pie business. It has a very large supply business into ready meals in Woolworths. It has a significant export business in tinned fruit and jams, uh, purees and, uh, and, uh, and concentrates again from fruit and interestingly uh, South African fruit as, as I said earlier is seen as one of the top quality fruits produced in any of the main markets which uh, is basically China, Spain and Greece. We are seen as one of the top quality producers and the, the product that most retailers and bakeries and food service companies want to use internationally which is why exports are very prominent in Rhodes life. The company had a very uh, strong trading update to its five months, which came out on the 11th of March. Uh, results should be out around the 22nd of May. And I think right now the stock is trading at 13 Rand 70. Uh, so in a price earnings ratio of, uh, of roughly, again, about seven, seven and a half times, very much in line with Sea Harvest and with, uh, with uh, Lipstar. But the underlying prospects for the group, I think, are probably better than the other two because the product it produces... Uh, is seen as a, as a, as a far more in-demand product internationally. And at the end of the day, they convert fruit into a value-added product, into jams, uh, concentrates, et cetera, et cetera, and even these little plastic cups of, uh, of fruit which are exported. Uh, they mentioned to me that uh, they export 22 million cups of, uh, of fruit a year to the U.S., and between 55 and 60 million tins of fruit. That's a lot of fruit. So uh, for someone like Rhodes, whose market cap is actually uh, about seven point, sorry, the turnover is 7.8 billion with a market value of 3.6 billion. It's the largest company of the three that I've talked about today. Uh, sea Harvest market cap is 2.6, Lipstar's 2.4, and uh, Rhodes is at uh, 3.6. It's a large business, even though its turnover is, uh, is actually, you know, in the middle of a range, but it adds value to all the product it beneficiates. And I think that's the key thing that uh, the stock market wants to see in investors. They, they want to see value adding beneficiation, uh, exports and the ability to convert basic product into foods that extra margin can be trapped. And Rhodes does that extremely well. 
And then with that said, I'm keen for us uh, to, uh, you know, uh, rank them from one to three uh, for the benefits of our retail investors here. It does sound like Rhodes is number one, but let's hear what you say. <laughs> well, uh, again, given that all stocks year to date have performed, uh, you know, I was going to say abysmally, but down 1% is hardly abysmal. Mm -hmm. If I had to rank them one, two, three, uh, it would be Rhodes, uh, Sea Harvest, Libstar. Um, but again, I have to caveat in terms of special situations and the possibility there may be some form of uh, acquisition uh, target in the next 12 to 18 months. Libstar at three rand 49 is clearly my pick of a bunch. Uh, sea Harvest again uh, for a portfolio looking for international growth in a category where there's going to be rising long term demand in fish is a counter which I think has great prospects. But as it stands right now, one, two, three would be Rhodes, Sea Harvest. Sorry, Rhodes, Libstar, Sea Harvest. Brilliant, Anthony. And in our educational segment today, what do you have for us? Yeah, we have, uh, our, on, on your questioning, an accelerated book build. Mm. Uh, we have an example to use. Uh, last week, uh, Premier Group, which is the country's one of the country's largest food companies, it owns a Blue Ribbon uh, brand of bread, um, had an accelerated book build, which caught the market by surprise. Now, what that basically means is that a large existing shareholder, in this case, Cristo Visa and the private equity company Breit, wanted to raise some money quickly. So rather than going through the process of trying to find buyers to, uh, to place the stock at, which could lead to the share price being depressed as the news starts to filter out that there's a large uh, a, a parcel of stock for sale, because we all know there's rumors of a large stock sale, the price tends to weaken. So they do what's called an accelerated book build, where they literally knock on your door as a major institution saying, hey, we've got shares to sell. Uh, it's this many shares. Do you want any? And if you do, at what price? And then they get the uh, amalgamated price back where of, uh, of an average price where people are looking to pay. And they say, fine, there's a price. In this case, it was 60 Rand. And if there's more demand than, uh, than has been indicated, uh, they do what's called a green shoe and extra shares are basically placed. Mm. So what happened last week is that uh, Premier um, saw a billion rand of shares placed and that money went into a rates back pocket. Uh, the share price of uh, Premier actually weakened. It's still trading just above the placement price. So I think the market's got enough bread in its uh, belly for the time being. So I don't see any movement in the share price. But uh, with March results ahead, and I spoke to the company on Monday, I anticipate another very good set of results coming. So I think those that participated in the accelerated book build at 60 Rand will probably have some extra butter on their bread come the March results. Brilliant, Anthony. Thank you so much for that one. And enjoy the long weekend. And thank you for joining us on Stock Picks this afternoon. That was Anthony Clark from Small Talk Daily Research. And that's all from the Business Lunch team this afternoon. Catch the show again tomorrow, same time, same place.